thank you everyone for joining. I'm actually almost your time zone. I made my real post-COVID first flight. I'm now in our Tel Aviv engineering office. So while in your time zone, I'm heavily jet lagged. So I just made it here. Uh, so hopefully uh, everything is going to be okay, but you can actually see the Israeli office uh, picture behind me. Uh, so you know uh, uh, I'm there. I'm going to go through a quick Weka intro, uh, telling you a little bit uh, about the company, but I like making things interactive. If you have questions, please do barge in. I'm, I'm, I prefer it this way. Um, so if anything is unclear, if you want to know some more, please, please chime in. So we started Weka uh, because we wanted to solve storage for the next decade or for the next decades. And uh, we're, we're building the storage to fit the future of the digital transformations the CIOs care about, and we embrace cloud and the GPU compute. Uh, we go and we solve the bigger problems and a good proof point is that eight of the Fortune 50 companies are our customers. Many of the Fortune 500s are our customers. Uh, we are uh, we have very good success for a younger uh, storage company in these very conservative, large institutions and corporates, basically because we solve problems, no other vendor solves for them. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a great uh, proof point. Uh, also, a lot of the industry leaders are also backers of WACA, so from the actual vendors. We have Cisco and Hewlett Packard Enterprise that are investors. NVIDIA and Mellanox are investors soon. Hopefully they're going to merge their VC. Uh, Qualcomm, Micron, Western Digital, Seagate. So we have a lot of very good backing from uh, terrific companies. We do get uh, great accolades from the industry. So Fast Companies named us uh, one of the best solutions for AI, most innovation for AI. We're in the uh, uh, JMP Securities Elite 80 private companies. We get great uh, accolades from our customers and the Gartner peer reviews. And uh, actually we have Enrico that put us as a leader on uh, the GigaOM radar for high performance object storage, which uh, is a new feature uh, for us. So thanks Enrico, uh, we appreciate it. Uh, we obviously get uh, the, uh, data breakthrough, AI, uh, uh, intelligence, you know, we, are, we have to keep track. We actually get this every year. So now you see the 2021, the 2020, um, it's getting kind of uh, uh, boring, but we do get this award uh, every year. And we're focusing on solving unstructured data. Why are we focused on solving unstructured data we're focusing on that because this is what's interesting to solve today. It's already about 90% of the data that uh, organizations have, and it's growing at 41% year over year. So this is where most of the organizations actually care about uh, making a difference. Uh, and you know, if you look at SAN, the, the growth there uh, is a staggering two and a half percent year over year. Uh, we're, we're focusing where uh, it's really interesting to innovate. Another very important point about Weka, we don't sell the finished good. We are a software company and you can think of us like an arm. So I don't know what phone you have in your pocket, uh, but I'm certain that the CPU the transit phone was designed by ARM and ARM doesn't even have a fab. The same is with Weka. Um, we build the foundation, we build the IP for incredible, the best storage systems uh, available today, but we don't sell them to the end customer. We, we, we're either available through the AWS marketplace or you can buy full-fledged appliances from Hewlett Packard Enterprise Supermicro. You can buy it from Hitachi Vantara. They actually don't call it Weka, they call it HCSF, the Hitachi Content uh, Software for File. Uh, you can buy Origin AI from Penguin Computing or 
Cisco, Dell, Lenovo. So uh, instead of any other storage vendor that forces you to go and uh, buy, uh, buy their own appliance, and it may be a different vendor from who you're buying your servers with Weka, when you're buying your servers, you can get the storage as well. So we enable our customers to go and, uh, and run their business uh, with less vendors. Obviously, we also let them mix and match. So you can choose, hey, I want to run my important production or a Hitachi or a Hewlett Packard, and I would run the DR on a Supermicro or an AWS. So we enable customers the choice of how they'd like to deploy basically our world leaking storage uh, solution. Now we said that we're solving for the cloud and for AI. This is a quote from Jeff Herbst. He's the VP of BD at NVIDIA. And basically what he tells uh, the NVIDIA customers that GPU performance is growing. And as the GPU performance grows and becomes faster and faster, the data movement becomes actually more and more important. And what we did, we pioneered impressive modern file system that helps uh, build, uh, moving this pro uh, project into production and we are accelerating AI at scale. So basically NVIDIA says that Weka helps solve AI at scale for their GPUs. Some customer proof points. Uh, this is one of my favorite. It's a, uh, unfortunately a very secret customer that is dear to my heart, but uh, they're one of the uh, uh, autonomous uh, uh, driving vendors. And when they switched to Weka from uh, their other vendors, we were actually able to get them down from two weeks to four hours. And if you are looking at the math, it actually means that what they do with Weka in a week is equivalent to a year on the competition. And actually since then they've scaled their GPUs and they've scaled their Weka several time folds. So they have uh, probably two orders of magnitude bigger there now when, when, they, uh, when they started initially and we basically enabled them to make it to market a lot before uh, the, the other ones proving that Weka is indeed uh, key to making uh, AI work at scale. Genomics England, uh, of I think the home country of, of most of you, switched to Weka from EMC Isilon and Extreme IO. And what we enabled them, we enabled them to scale at great economics and because we're so much simple to manage, reduce their amount of admin. So we were able to get their per genome cost from 52 pounds per genome to two pounds per genome at 26 times cost saving. Also, we're able to, uh, they were able to take their admin team down from five folks to half a person. So we get you better performance, better scale, better economics at uh, uh, increased ease of use. Now, uh, OMRF also was an Isilon customer and they were running uh, Genomics DB. It's a very complex application to run. They were running it on their Isilon and it would take 70 days and four out of five times it would fail. Think about uh, the researcher that has waited for 70 days only to figure out the work didn't finish. When once they switched to Weka, they were able to finish it within seven days and it always finished after the week. So it's 50 times uh, the, the time improvement in finishing. And actually, you know, when, when you're running something for a week, you can actually wait for the results and remember what you want and get a lot of the science, uh, the science done. Uh, it's a huge difference for them. This is uh, from a couple of weeks ago, our benchmark that we were running uh, Stack M3 and we were showing that Weka that's running on AWS runs Stack M3, which is 
the time series databases that financial uh, services organizations are using for equity or for Forex or for risk analysis, we were able to help them uh, switch what they're using from very peculiar on-prem solutions like uh, a DDN luster solution or an all, uh, all flash Isilon or a local attached uh, Optane with local servers or Vexata or Pavilion. And we showed them that running work on the cloud on standard AWS instances actually finishes quicker than any of the peculiar on-prem solutions. So not only we make it simpler to run on-prem, we actually let customers move their challenging workloads to the cloud. And this is something that no other vendor actually allows them to do. Any other solution on AWS or even AWS's uh, own organic services. And we made this submission together with AWS. Obviously they would have preferred to run it on their own. We have uh, something very unique about Weka which is our multi-protocol access and our ability to scale. At Weka, we provide access through our own POSIX, through NFS, through SMB for Windows, through S3, to Kubernetes and GP direct storage. It means that unlike any other storage, and we're doing it at incredible scale and terrific speed, it means that with other vendors, you actually have to ingest data to one system, copy to the HPC storage, then copy it locally to the GPU cluster, copy the results back because different storage systems have different protocols they support with different semantics and different performance characteristics. Customers are forced to store several copies of their data. It's costly and it's also very difficult to manage. With Weka, we basically move them to what we're calling our zero copy architecture. So they can do the data ingest, the GPU processing, uh, the connection to the, uh, the researchers on the windows, everything that they need to do through the single platform. And we also manage the backup and DR for them. So they're getting soup to nuts, the complete solution from Weka, and they don't have to store their data several times. They don't have to go integrate different kinds of systems. Another thing uh, that uh, is special about Weka, and here we're comparing it to uh, the Supermicro uh, solution that we have, but we can, we can do it similar with, uh, with the other vendors. This is just an example. When you're comparing the Weka Rec scale to basically any other storage, uh, we basically leave them dust. So if you look at the pure flash blade, the NetApp, the two Isilons, VAST, uh, we compare them by their CPU architecture, what kind of PCA con connection they have, what media they use, what uh, raw capacity they have per, per rec, what performance they get. And we actually mark on each of the product who is best. And then we say, let's imagine this Franken storage. Franken storage is the best of each cell out of the competitors that we have in the market and we call it Franken storage. And then you have the Weka. And what you end up seeing is Weka on every line is best than the Franken storage. And Franken storage is actually not a product you can buy. So when you're buying Weka, you know that you're buying the best today, but because we're software, you're also future-proofing it uh, down, uh, down the road. Again, going back to the several copies, when you're buying from the legacy vendors, when you're buying standard storage, you're basically choosing the what kind of silos uh, you implement. And you may have different silos for the performance. You may have different silos for capacity. You may have different silos for access protocol. And it means that uh, it's a lot of hassle to manage. And it means that it's a lot of cost because you can't store your data several times. Weka 
because of a zero copy basically enables you to store all your data once on a single system and manage it uh, Even one time. Yes. I have a question. Uh, of course. You know, in the previous slide, you, you mentioned, you know, that you have the best performance uh, uh, of all the other vendors. I mean, uh, you are still uh, comparing your solution with NVMe drives. Do, do you think that you can get even better with Octane? Does it make any sense? adding an, an Octane layer, like something like uh, Vast with the two layers uh, or, or uh, you know, it's good enough. I mean, I, I'm talking about optimization of performance, cap, you know, the, the trade-off, the various trade-off, it makes any sense at the moment. So uh, there are three, three parts to the answer. A, we are software and our software is going to run over Optane and it will be even faster. But Weka on NVMe TLC is faster than the other solutions running on Optane having to pay the Optane prices. So we don't need to pay the high prices for Optane uh, in, in order to get our performance. This is one thing. Second, uh, Optane is currently uh, dead end technology. So, you know, Intel uh, actually wanted to divest away out of all their solid state storage. So they wanted to sell their SSD and their Optane. They were on market for a while. About a year ago, they sold just the flash business uh, to SK Hynix. And the reason they sold only the flash business is because SK Hynix told them that they're unwilling and they were very public about it to buy the 3D crosspoint. Now, uh, a few months later, Micron, which is the manufacturer of the wafers, uh, the chips for 3D crosspoint for Optane, actually said, hey, we don't think Optane has place in the market. And they said they, they said that uh, also quite publicly. And the, I understand it's because they couldn't uh, convince any hyperscaler to, uh, to adopt Optane. And because no hyperscaler adopted it, they didn't see how economies of scale are going to, uh, to happen for Optane. So Micron is stopping to manufacture the wafers. And so far, Intel um, did not come with any comment on uh, what are their plans. And there's quite an insistent assumption in the marketplace that after they deliver some of the supercomputers they sold to the DOE, they're going to announce that they're dropping uh, Optane. So currently, I don't think unless very soon we're going to hear from Intel what their plans are for the future of Optane, or the future of 3D Crosspoint. I don't think making 3D Crosspoint architectural decisions is, uh, is sound. So technically running Weka over Optane will go faster, uh, but it's too expensive and too risky to build Optane-based systems today. What about QLC then? I mean, uh... So, uh, Q at the other... so Q Q QLC uh, is a great technology that is probably going to start happening in uh, a year or two. Today, when you're looking at pricing, uh, QLC is not less expensive than TLC. So if you go and, and you buy at, at scale, you're gonna pay similar prices for QLC and TLC devices. And this is a very easy experiment for you to go and, on, and, and just look uh, for consumers uh, sites, but you're gonna find similar results when you buy it bulk. Because QLC costs similar to TLC and TLC is obviously superior, QLC today has no justification in the marketplace. Now in about, a year or slightly after NVMe 2 with ZNS is coming out, they're changing the definition. They're going to enable, obviously the storage will have to be aware. They're going to enable building controllers 
to support QLC that will have a lot less RAM, much simpler controllers, and way smaller super caps. Mm -hmm. At that point, you could build QLC devices uh, that are cheaper than TLC and also bigger. And when these devices are going to come out, and I'm not breaking any embargo because all the, all the vendors say they are, we will support them. When it's going to happen, we're not the persons to, to answer, but rest assured that when QLC devices are going to be out, we're going to enable uh, the low cost QLC of the future to be supported under WEC with terrific performance. Okay, good. And also terrific economics. And, and, and ZNS QLC is a totally makes sense uh, technology. Any more questions? I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm actually now out of my time. So I'll go very quickly through the rest of my, uh, rest of my slides. So when, when you looked at the other architectures, you had to choose between scale up, let's say a net up or scale out. Weka is the only vendor that lets you both scale up and we show it on the AWS, you double the instant size, you get twice the performance, or scale out, you double the amount of instances of the, the same type, you double the performance. This is unprecedented. There has no been any storage up until now that does both scale up and scale out in a linear fashion that really allows customers the choice on how to build, but we're also adding other forms of scale. So we are scaling across we let, uh, we run mixed workloads, we run missed applications. If you run IO workloads, you're gonna get low latency and tons of IOs. If you're running bandwidth, you're gonna get extreme throughput. We're scaling across flash and disk with our tiering to object storage. We're scaling across the protocols between file and object. So we really support everything and we enable scaling to the cloud. You can scale the cloud for DR, or for capacity or performance. And in the cloud, this is also unique. You can scale across availability zones. And this is something that even the AWS's native products uh, don't support. So again, you're gonna hear more about it from Shimon. So I'll be very brief. We run all your applications through all the protocols you care about, POSIX, NFS, SMB, S3, GPU direct storage, one should become uh, GA, CSI for Kubernetes. Uh, we get the incredible NVMe flash performance and you can tier to an on-prem object storage, to a cloud object storage, and you can save our snapshots. Uh, so you're also getting backup. And now we're coming up with incremental only immutable snapshots that can be leveraged as archive and also protect you from uh, ransomware attacks. Uh, you can leverage it to run uh, on both sides. So you can have this WACA tier and save snapshots locally, save snapshots to AWS S3, then run an EC2 cluster on AWS, enabling access to the same media. You can see that we have quite uh, a lot of partners. And just last week, we added uh, EMC ECS. So now we're supporting 100% of the large uh, L, uh, object storage uh, market. So basically what you're getting with WACA is the only storage system that provides simplicity, speed and scale at good economics. So this is the reason to basically go and switch to WACA from uh, the existing legacy storage uh, solution. And I could have gone deeper, but I'm sure uh, Shimon is going to cover it all terrific way. So if you have more questions, now it's the time. Great. So, hey, guys, uh, nice to, to meet you. I'll take it from here. And uh, what I want to do is to provide actually a, a technology deep dive. Uh, we, we've seen the presentation about the work of values and what it enables. I actually want to dig in, in the bits and the bytes uh, of how we do many things. So first of all, I wanted to read clarify because uh, sometimes we present the work of values and then the question is, but yeah, but what's the, the core innovation? So eventually the core innovation is, is, a, is the data platform 
that we provide that uh, is exposed also as a parallel file system. So we support multiple protocols, but we expose files. Uh, I will also say what we are not. We are not a block device. We are not an NVMe of a fabric environment. Uh, and we are not a regular object store. We are a high performance parallel file system built for flash technology that also provides a data platform on top of it um, that will provide uh, several of the features and capabilities that I'll show that Liran also, also mentioned, the data movement, the ability to expand uh, over to multiple environments. And as mentioned, we are fully software defined. So uh, as mentioned, you'll see throughout the presentation also, we, we don't have our own hardware. We are running on multiple um, commodity hardware vendors. Um, I will say one, one more thing about it. Uh, we worked hard with a lot of our uh, hardware vendors so that uh, when a customer needs to purchase a system, they can just say, hey, I need a worker with that capacity. And, and that vendor will already has the relevant screws and configurations. So that actually simplifies the process. Um, in terms of high level value. Um, Sorry, can I just interrupt? I have a question here from Anthony Adshed. He says, what vendors do customers switch from when they move to Weka? So what other storage vendors <laughs> are switching? to um, Liran's last point, actually. So oh, sorry. I don't think it's, it's possibly something best covered in a little while. It's not yeah, a I, question. I, yeah, I, I can briefly say, so uh, we, we are replacing the you know, the, the incumbents. So the most of uh, systems we replace are EMC Dell Isilon or with their modern name um, PowerScale, uh, just because of how prevalent and popular it, it is for customers that have a lot of data. We are replacing uh, the IBM GPFS either through IBM solutions or through places where DDN was reselling it. Um, we are replacing, we are starting recently to replace a lot of NetApps, uh, which initially was a surprise for me because NetApps are usually smaller, but we're going to sites and they have tons of NetApps. And then we're placing, uh, you know, a sea of NetApps with a single Weka. So these would be the, the top, uh, the top three, uh, power scale, um, GPFS, a little bit of luster and NetApps. Right, so thanks. Uh, uh, by the way, I'll also add to that, that um, you'll see throughout the presentation that um, with the performance characteristics of the, of the worker environment, uh, we also eliminate the need for local NVMEs. So environments uh, where data was, and I think Liwan also showed it in one of his slides, where data would be ingested from a shared environment to a local server NVMe and then being uh, analyzed over through a GPU or CPU environment on the local NVMe um, are now eliminated because you don't need to manage and purchase the local NVMe's with what you can do with Weka. So, and, and we'll talk more about it. So looking at uh, the characteristics of what we call legacy parallel file systems, uh, and there's a lot out there, right? So eventually, if you look at the architecture, and obviously the next uh, slide is going to be the Weka architecture, um, they're composed of multiple moving parts. So you have the parallel file system layer that is exposed to the compute servers. So that's the, the experience that the user would get, but under the hood, they would have multiple metadata servers, multiple admin servers, protocol gateways, if you need to support multiple protocols, and then the data nodes, all of these would usually have their own local file systems. They would utilize, usually the metadata servers would be on some sort of NVMe of a fabric. The data nodes might be even using a third party storage. So eventually it, it's, a, it's a mixture of components that were made to work together. And obviously there is some value in that, uh, but they were, they're not one cohesive unit. You need to, and also you need to manage multiple components when managing your environment. So with Sweka, the design is actually um, to simplify everything. You'll see in the architecture slide where we actually wrote uh, all of these components ourselves, but building it out, how do we create a Weka system? So we create a Weka system just by taking multiple servers. And again, these are commodity servers off the shelf servers. 
could be uh, HPE, Supermicro, Dell, Hitachi, <clears throat> Penguin, and more, uh, or could be AWS instances. So just by taking these commodity servers, the only requirement servers is that they will have NVMEs and the high-speed networking between them. So there's no requirement for um, NVDIMs, NVRAMs, um, solid states. Um, uh, there's no requirement for uh, JBODs, JBOFs, uh, RAID controllers. Um, this is WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. You, we only require servers with NVMEs. By doing that, what we actually do is we install Weka on top of these servers, and then we aggregate them and pull all of their NVMEs into the Weka namespace. And then we expose that namespace over multiple protocols uh, to the compute servers. So that's the key design point, uh, and we'll talk more about it. In terms of how do we expose it to the compute servers, so you can see that the compute servers actually can be um, multiple compute servers. By the way, these servers, and it's important to understand, these servers uh, can be uh, Intel CPUs, AMD CPUs. Um, when, when new CPUs are being released to the market, we're usually uh, the first to actually certify them. So customers can immediately um, benefit from new technologies as they come out. There's no um, box certification that takes several months usually in a hardware environment. So that's one of the benefits of being fully software defined. If we look at the compute servers, uh, they could be GPU, CPU compute servers. They could be um, um, containerized, uh, Kubernetes orchestrated. Uh, and as you can see, there are multiple platforms that we see that are using this environment. And we'll talk about why, but as a segue, uh, you'll see that when we'll talk about the Weka performance, uh, we characterize it as best of performance in IOPS, throughput, latency, and metadata. So a lot of the shared environment and definitely a lot of the scale out shared environment, uh, the parallel file systems out there uh, are really good at providing, when they say performance, they actually mean throughput. So how many gigabytes per second can they provide? With Sweka, the way we design the system is that it can actually provide massive amounts of throughput and we'll see how in a bit, but it can also provide massive amounts of IOPS on the same data sets. It can also provide massive amounts of metadata and low latency on the same data sets. So there is no need to create throughput file systems, IOPS file system, and then try to pinpoint your application um, to that, to these specific file systems. Actually, the fun part here is that you just run your application and the storage is already adapted to your application. You don't try to, to adapt your application to the file system that you're running on. So that's another design point. And, and we'll see, by the way, why. Uh, we support multiple protocols. So there is obviously our high performance uh, POSIX component. So eventually we, we appear as a mount point on, on the servers and, and you can actually create thousands of, of, of Weka file systems on a single cluster. And obviously this could be exposed using our POSIX protocol, our high performance POSIX protocol, which we'll see how it's uh, working in a bit. We also support other protocols, as Liran mentioned, NFS, uh, S3, SMB, um, and GPU direct storage. So what we see now when we work with customers is that uh, it's not enough to, to be really good at one application. Uh, what you want to enable, you want to enable a complete pipeline. So if we look at an entire pipeline of a customer, <clears throat> sorry, um, that really starts when the, the customer is ingesting the data through a data hub, through IoT devices, through external storage, then there's, a, uh, in many cases, some sort of uh, ETL phase or ELT phase that we see now as well, uh, where that data is being analyzed and, and changed. And then um, in, in multiple environments, it's being trained and inferenced on. So you want to accommodate for that data to be ingested to a single place. Usually what we see is that, and Liran showed the slide about it, is that uh, there are multiple environments that are being used simply because they support different protocols. So for example, if my IoT, if my scopes, if my sequencers um, so need to push the data over SMB, then I'll have an SMB storage. If they need to share, push it over S3, uh, I'll have an S3 storage, and then I'll copy it around to my high performance storage. So the unique thing here is that you can always ingest uh, and work on the same data in multiple protocols, um, and you don't need to choose. You don't need to copy the data. And as I mentioned, because of the performance characteristics, throughput, IOPS latency, and metadata performance, that, that's what we see as the four pillars of performance, you don't even need to copy to your local NVMEs, which we still see customers doing. 
So getting back to the Weka design points, um, just by aggregating multiple servers with 10 VMEs, we're able to create the Weka file system. Another, and, and we have customers doing that in, in the low terabytes and in the high petabytes. So another um, unique thing here is that we decoupled performance from capacity. There is no need, there, there's a um, kind of like a myth or a concept that um, you need to over provision your capacity in order to get high performance. And you see it in many ways. Uh, if you want a, a certain, perform, uh, certain high performance, uh, you need to start in a few petabytes. Uh, with Weka, you can get to hundreds of gigabytes and millions of IOPS on the same data, even with our small data set, with our small cluster. And then you can expand the cluster as you go, gaining more capacity and more performance. But there's no need to start large uh, only to get the performance. So that's the Weka flash tier. Um, moving on, we also have the ability, uh, it's an optional component, but we actually see it as a very differentiating uh, ability to uh, expand our environment into multiple object stores, to private environments, to pri private clouds or public clouds. And, and I'm not saying tiering on purpose, I'm saying extending the file system because eventually um, the use case is, imagine that you have a Weka flash tier that could be, again, could be a hundred terabytes, it could be several petabytes. And then you have the object store could be your on-prem object store environment that is several petabytes. The, the customer experience is that they're now seeing a file system or they can carve each of their file systems according to it that is composed out of the flash capacity and the total capacity of the object store. So now they see a unified namespace that we can now scale the data between the flash tier and the object storage tier in a transparent way. So for example, if a server is asking for data, that data could be served from the Weka flash tier or it could be served from the object store by Weka going to the object store and, and getting that data. So uh, there is the, the compute server doesn't even need to know where the data is. There's definitely no need to use a third party application to move the data between the tiers. Um, the, the, the important thing is that Weka does it. And what we see, and we'll go over a few examples in a bit, is that at scale, that actually uh, is the only way to do it. Because when you have petabytes of capacity or billions of inodes, um, it's really hard for other environments, other third-party backup or data movers uh, to, to work at that scale, to crawl on the file system, to try to decide what to move. Uh, we see customers that simply never had backup or DR environment because of their scale. And the Weka native capability of moving the data actually enables them to do that. And a single worker system can now connect to multiple um, cloud environments. So some file systems, and I'm gonna use my crayons here, but some cloud system, some file systems can be connected to the, um, maybe to your on-prem object store for system namespace extension. Uh, and some could be connected to your public cloud, maybe for backup and retention. So uh, one use case of that is obviously to, to make the, the solution scale in capacity. Uh, another use case, as we mentioned, is backup and DR. And I'll show one example um, where imagine that you have a data center, or this could be also on, on AWS running it in an AZ, where your Weka cluster uh, expands to your object store. And organically data moves back and forth. And then what the customer would periodically do, they would send a snapshot from the Weka flash tier to the object storage tier. And that actually would create a metadata, an independent metadata package that actually describes the file system that was snapshotted. And again, imagine a customer that has hundreds or thousands of file systems, and each of them is doing that every hour or every day. So now the customer have uh, an independent backup copy of the entire, of the metadata and data of, this, of the environment on the object store, which actually means that if, that worker system ceases to exist. Maybe it's instances that uh, were decommissioned on purpose. Maybe it's a, it's a, it's a problem with the hardware that caused something. Uh, you can just bring up another worker system on, on the same data center that could be, as they want to mention, composed out of different hardware components, different servers, different NVMEs, different capacities, and actually mount that data. So now we actually uh, essentially created a backup of the environment. And then if that object store is geo-replicated or maybe it's even erasure coded over three sites or more, then the data that we wrote on one site is now available on another site. 
and could be consumed in case of a DR scenario, in case your data center dropped, could be consumed on another worker cluster at another data center. So just by saying, hey, I have a worker system that scales between the flash tier and the object storage tier, and periodically it sends snapshots, and Joel is gonna show us how we're doing that. It's one click of a button or one command in our uh, CLI or API. Uh, you now have a backup in a DR. Another use case is, uh, and, and there's a lot more to talk about it as well. Uh, another use case is an environment that is, um, could be that I have a work environment on my, in my data center, and I just want to periodically send backups of my file systems to the cloud. So my DR strategy, and we, by the way, we do see customers doing that. Uh, my DR strategy is now, if my data center drop, I just spin up work instances on the cloud and start working on them. And then when my data center is recovered, I burst back in. So I don't need to, to invest in a secondary data center until I really need it. So I, I, I switch CapEx to OpEx. And a third... Um... Sorry, sorry, Shimon, sorry, before you carry on. Oh, Barbara just beat him I into it. To, Shimon, there's a question that came in and it was related to pre previously. So we just wanted to uh, ask, it was related yeah. to um, how Weka can handle specific mechanisms like SMB uplocks when several users are working with the same data over different protocols. So I, um, I think I think I'll touch that in the next slides. Perfect. When we talk about the architecture. Thank you. So um, finishing up the, the data movement. So what we see is that um, the worker is able to expand to multiple object stores, to multiple private or public clouds. And then you get to choose um, how you move the data. So for example, even if I have an environment that is connected to one object store to a, to a local environment for namespace extension, then I can also say, hey, but periodically I want to send my backup to another data center, could be on, again, could be a cloud environment. So now I have my DR. And even if my object store doesn't replicate between them, Weka would move the data between them. So th that ability to free the data, uh, I think in, in some places we call it data gravity, releasing the data from the data gravity is actually uh, unique and, and important. It really enables use cases uh, that were hard to achieve before at the scale of the customers that we're, we're seeing. And now jumping on, um, but by the way, if, definitely if there's any questions on, on the data movement, I'll be glad to, to answer. Yeah, yeah, just um, you've, you've kind of given us the use cases at one level, but what, what would be the sort of real world applications of, of shifting data around in the ways you've described? Oh, and DR is, quite concrete. Uh, freeing data from data gravity is relatively abstract. Um, I just wondered if you could make it more concrete. Sure, sure, sure. So imagine um, uh, the backup NDR use cases, which are concrete. You want to make sure that you, you, you're able to always recover on a remote environment in case of a failure, or maybe uh, be protected against human, human level errors or ransomware, for example. So by sending the data to another location or making it immutable, even on your own location, uh, you, you're now protected. Nobody can touch that. You can always return to that point in time. Um, we see that also a lot in um, customers that are running on the cloud. So if I'll go back to this environment, imagine a customer that is running on the cloud uh, and then periodically sends the data. And uh, we have an example, actually, um, there are public customers, so we, we'd love to share them with you also. Uh, they have hundreds uh, of file systems and daily they push the data from these file systems to the cloud as a backup as well. Uh, some of the customers choose when running on the cloud to, to send the snapshots to the cloud and then drop the, the entire cluster. Because now if I sent my file system to my object store and I drop my instances because maybe I don't need it now, maybe I just brought up a worker cluster to crunch some uh, genomic sequencing data or to, to uh, render a movie and I don't need it anymore. I just dropped the worker cluster after I pushed the, the environment, uh, the data, the file system as it is with all of the metadata and structures and permissions uh, to my object store. So then later on when I have another project, if I need to access that data, I can just spin up another worker cluster and use it. So that's the latter is more like a, a bursting type scenario. It's a bursting. It's also a pricing price control mechanism because 
if you are able to say, hey, I'm spinning up my cluster on AWS where I pay by the hour, uh, only when needed, it's really attractive because you, you get the best of all because you get the cluster when you need it, but the data is always there because when you pushed it to S3 by using Weka, you didn't need to do it yourself. It's, it's you actually control the price. Make sense? Yeah. Yes, but uh, Bertrand Gear from La Formatica in France. But how do you do that? Because uh, some, uh, some interfaces as uh, CSI have limitation. For example, there is no replication in CSI. How do you manage it in this kind of uh, environment? We actually push the data in the file system granularity. So imagine um, a container that was brought up, created a file system, worked on that file system, um, when you finished, when you want to spin down that container, for example, and you do want maybe to even spin, to, to save that data for longer retention. Uh, first of all, you can either choose to, to leave it on the file system, or you can say, hey, we can just take a snapshot of that file system and push it. So you don't do it through the CSI, you do it through the Weka system API. Okay, thank you for the precision. Great. So looking at the Weka architecture, how do we do what we do or um, part, how do we partially do? This partially explains how do we do what we do. Um, there, there is a um, few components here. So first of all, we see the Weka storage nodes. So these are the servers, as I mentioned, the commodity servers that have the NVMe um, in them. And uh, on the right side, we see the application servers. So these are your GPU, CPU, containerized um, or not servers running your application. So what we see is, uh, first of all, we divided the world here into user space, kernel space, and hardware environment uh, to show uh, where we run. And you can see that we, we run in user space. So the Weka environment, if you look at the storage nodes, it's uh, fully on, in user space. On the client side, it's fully in user space, aside from a kernel VFS module, um, we'll talk about it. Um, we, we chose to run in user space because we didn't want to go down the route of creating our own operating system, forcing a customer to install uh, our own uh, environment because customers have different requirements, different operating system, different kernel versions. So running in user space as an application actually allows us to benefit from that because for example, when new hardware is coming out, uh, operating systems are moving on to support it, we'll run on this operating system and support it as well, right? So we run in user space. You can see um, the gray boxes here are um, actually containers. So all of our environment is containerized, which actually means that it gives us really fine grain control on um, what it's doing. So how many resources it's taking. Um, we can limit it or we can allow it to use everything. So for example, on the client environment, um, even the client component is running in user space uh, within its own container that again, as mentioned, it's tightly controlled and segregated. So it will never um, bloat and, and take more than uh, required or more than configured. Um, the IO path would be the application would run an IO into kernel space, going into the VFS layer, going into our VFS kernel module. Basically the only thing that this kernel module does is throw the IO into our client component in user space. That client component, uh, as, as I showed before, uh, that's our POSIX client component, is now aware of the system and it's able to communicate with all of the other software nodes, all of the other storage nodes. And you see that there's a many to many connections. So a single client would always communicate with multiple storage nodes. And, and I'll mention that as well. When, when it needs to communicate with the, the, the rest of the environment, obviously, um, through the network, uh, what we do is we also implemented our own networking stack in user space. We didn't want to rely on any existing, we didn't want to rely even on the kernel to, to, uh, for our networking stack because uh, we wanted to provide high performance and low latency when working through the kernel that is not optimized for work operations. It's optimized for, uh, in, at, at best, it's optimized for the computer uh, operations uh, we wanted to, to make sure that we have control even while not forcing our own kernel. So by writing our own network environment in user space, we actually bypass the kernel. We utilize the technology called DPDK, Data Plane Development Kit. Uh, we wrote our own network stack in user space. We bypass the kernel space and we actually communicate directly with the hardware 
directly with the NIC when needed, when and, and that's needed for uh, IOs. So first of all, that's one of the improvements. We we don't use um, the kernel stack for for anything actually um, in that aspect. Uh, when communicating with the other storage nodes, so now the client has an IO, the client needs to go and, and communicate with the other servers for metadata and data, um, the client would communicate over our own proprietary protocol, um, which again, we, we chose not to use uh, TCP IP because again, TCP IP is, is not storage um, related. It's, it's built for multi-connectivity, multi-site connectivity. Um, we wanted to have something that uh, we can control that um, we control the back of the windows and uh, is actually frankly integrated with our uh, other layers. So we wrote our own protocol. Um, it's a very mature protocol. It's out there for more, more, many years already. And um, eventually it, it works over IP. So there is no need to change the network to adapt to it. Um, the next component, if now I'm looking at the storage servers, so that was the client side. If I'm looking now on the storage servers, uh, we are running multiple software nodes that are called backends. They're actually, you can think about it as, as the, the brain of the system. They're doing the data distribution. And, and a key component of them is actually to, to run what we call the virtual metadata servers. So if I'll go back to the system architecture here that you saw, as I mentioned, there's only servers within NVMEs. Uh, what you don't see is you don't see the concept of a metadata server, right? As you do with uh, other parallel file systems. And that's because um, we are actually running our own me virtual metadata servers across all of the environment. So all of the storage nodes uh, on, on, on multiple CPUs where we are running, and again, we'll, we'll be containerized and be, be running on the CPUs that were allocated to us, which sometimes could be all or not, we'd be running virtual metadata servers. So now imagine because we solved the meta, and I'll explain more about it, because we solved the virtual metadata servers distribution, uh, we can now scale out easily uh, and we can more than that we can make sure that there is no hotspot there's no single metadata server that gets all of the ios uh, and, and is now becoming a, a button like in terms of performance but also scalability so a single client would talk with multiple virtual metadata servers concurrently so it's unlike nfs where nfs is a one-to-one -one connection um, with weka our client is actually communicating with multiple uh, with multiple and all servers concurrently, the servers would now need to go in and provide the data or tell the client where the data is. So they would communicate our, using our own NVMe, internal NVMe with Fabric Layer that we wrote uh, with the SSD agents. And again, SSD agents are software nodes that are, um, you have multiple of them running um, on a single server, definitely multiple on a single environment. And they are responsible of feeding the data to the NVMEs. So eventually you want CPU cycles to, to push IOs in and push and bring IOs out. And, and that's the SSD agents. And here we also bypass the kernel because we didn't want to run on the kernel uh, NVMe stack. Um, again, the NVMe driver is, is generic. It's useful for many things, but it's not Weka or storage optimized. Um, we wrote our own NVMe driver in user space, which again, gives us a lot of control about how it's running and the timing and what we do with it, um, it actually yields more performance when running with Weka. So these are the main components. By the way, as you can see, we also run multiple, um, when cho chosen to, when a customer says uh, that they need to run an SME environment or an NFS environment or an S3 environment on Weka, uh, there's no need for uh, external protocol gateways. Uh, the, we, we containerized our SMB solution, NFS solution, and S3 solution, and they're running on the storage nodes. So the customer would also have a fine grained control of which of the servers would be running NFS or SMB or S3. So as mentioned, the other clients for, for the entire pipeline can push data back and forth into the system. And actually a lot of this is the reason where uh, when running on environments, uh, we show massive performance improvements compared to other solutions running on the same environments. And, and I'll mention one, by the way, um, when running um, on at, at, at a customer, and, and that's public, the customer is Microsoft, we, we actually showed 40 times performance on the same hardware when running compared to another parallel file system that was running there. 
four zero, four, 40 times performance. Um, the reason is, is actually here because we wrote all of the, all of the stack ourselves, starting from the client component, going down to bypassing the kernel over to the network, going over to the scale out metadata environment that we rewrote, and then even going down to the block placement. Uh, on the NVMEs, there is no local file system on the NVMEs, we control the block placement. So that actually gives us so much control on the life of an IO. The, the moment the IO is already in the VFS layer, we own all of the paths of the IO. There is no other third party protocol or third party hardware or third party file system that will uh, manage that IO for us. So we can take many intelligent decisions and, and optimize uh, for performance. So that's that. Uh, another way to think about it is, and by the way, this is, um, as we can see, that's one mode of running the um, dedicated environment. And I know that I, I'm limited to five more minutes, so I'll, I promise to finish in, in five minutes. Um, so this is the dedicated environment where you have your compute and uh, connected to a worker storage environment. Another way that uh, we see customers are using that and definitely with GPU servers, it's more and more prevalent uh, where your application servers is converged uh, with the Weka servers. So because we are containerized, because we can limit uh, the resources in a very fine grain control of what we are using, uh, actually you can say, hey, maybe I have a server with 64 NV um, CPUs and maybe Weka is using 10. So I have my GPUs, I have my CPUs, Weka will never use 10, Weka will never bloat to, to more than 10 because we have that fine grain control. And if I'm comparing that to other software defined storage solutions, um, which again, all have their use cases and, uh, and needs, um, with Sweka, a unique capability is to, to control that usage and never take more. So the customer can say, hey, I have my job scheduler, Sweka took 10 of, out of my 64. So now I, I know that I always will have 54 more uh, cores for my job schedulers to, to schedule jobs on. And actually that the use case here is that it provides customer with, uh, when you think about it, with a zero footprint storage, because if I made a, an investment on my GPU servers, I have, uh, I don't know, five, 10 more GPU servers. Maybe I don't want to spend more money on external storage. Maybe I just want to say, hey, I will just use the local NVMEs that are pre-built into the, these uh, GPU servers in, into a worker storage. So I get all of the benefit of the, the performance, which would be faster than my local NVMe, the share, the, the no need to copy data around, uh, the ability to move the data out, while not adding another box into my data center. Um, talking about um, how, how the IO path looks some more, and, and, and maybe I'll finish with that, is just, just to kind of like visualize how it's different with an NFS environment, uh, even a scale out NFS environment, you have your NFS head, your application server is mounting an NFS environment. Uh, it's, it's a one-to-one -one connection. Um, it, it's not utilizing all of the environment with different uh, parallel file systems. Your uh, application server is mounting usually the metadata server. Every IO goes through that. The metadata servers now redirects you to your OSSs, OSTs for the data. Uh, again, that's the classic architecture. Eventually that's it's easy for the metadata server to become a bottleneck. Uh, when you expand the environment, when you shrink it, it it's a nightmare. With Weka, uh, the way to visualize it is that the compute server uh, is now connected to all of the storage nodes concurrently, and they are connected to all of the remote storage nodes as well. So there's an end-to-end-to-end -to -end -to -end connectivity in the system, which actually guarantees that all of the hardware, and I think that's kind of like the holy grail, when you purchase a hardware environment, and, and definitely you want to get away from data silos, but you also want to make sure that in terms of performance, all of your hardware is, is utilized for the performance and there is no idle servers or idle CPUs or NVMEs that are not being used. With Sweka, the way we distribute uh, the virtual metadata servers and our uh, SSD agents across all of the environment, it actually guarantees that all of the data would be crunched by all of the virtual metadata servers. And, and there's a lot to talk about it, how we do it as well. Um, and then it's virtualized and sent across to multiple SSD agents as well. And I think eventually, and, and I think Liran also mentioned that, eventually this is the value to the customer. Um, two weeks to four hours is one, a wall clock time. 
how fast can you gain insights from your uh, from your from your data? Um, we can talk about speeds and feeds, but if we simplified your environment uh, and you now don't need to copy data around, um, and and we improve the performance, and and these are all order of, of magnitude that we see in many environments. Uh, this is an 84 times uh, performance improvement. It's not uncommon to see. So that's the value to the customer. And I'll finish with one customer that utilized Weka as, as an example, where um, they now have a 2.6 petabyte flash environment over a 60 petabyte connected to a 60 petabyte object storage environment. And eventually that simplified the environment. It allowed them to decrease their costs, by the way, by 75%. It allowed them to scale between multiple data center while still not needing to send tapes or, or anything. They just have the worker connected to an object store that is erasure coded between three sites and just sending the snapshots of worker to the object store. Now make sure that they're available on the remote site if needed. Uh, and eventually massive amounts of researchers are working on that data concurrently. And uh, I think with that, I'll, I'll finish. If there's any more tech questions, I'll be glad to take them. And if not, I'll hand it over to Joe for to really show us how it looks. Hi, everyone. Uh, appreciate your time. So as Shimon and Laurent have mentioned, we tend to talk an awful lot about the dimensions of uh, simplicity, speed, and scale. And so I'm going to show you a couple of demos here. A few of them are recorded simply because of the time constraints that we have here. and some of them I'll be doing uh, without a net, so completely live and on the fly for you as well. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about a little bit is the concept of, whoops, let me blow that up a bit for you, the concept of speed and performance here. So when you take a look at what Weka provides in this consolidated type of environment, um, we go through and we provide this incredibly high performance that gives you that zero copy capability. So in this particular case, we have an environment where we have nine storage hosts right here. Each one of them has a number of cores that are associated with them and a number of NVMe drives right here. If we walk through this, whoops, let me start play here. If we walk through this, we'll see that each one of these particular hosts has a certain number of drives, right? Six, and we're presenting 16 cores. And as Shimon mentioned, those cores are completely fenced off from the rest of the system. So it's dedicated performance across the board. We've gone ahead and created two different file systems, FS1 and FS2 uh, in this particular case. And I'm gonna fast forward a little bit here, but what, we, what we're showing here is that across those two, we're going to generate a synthetic workload using FIO. In this particular case, it's one megabyte block size, and it's going to be completely random read. And so instead of waiting for it, I'm just going to fast forward to the results. And congratulations. This is 100 gigabit uh, Ethernet uh, connectivity, and we're pushing 12.9 gigabytes per second. That's full saturation of a high performance uh, network pipe. Now, the one thing that Weka does really well is that if you had added additional NICs to the clients, it would have gone ahead and saturated those as well. And we don't care whether it's 100 gigabit, 200 gigabit, or even the 400 gigabit that companies like Mellanox and soon to be Cisco uh, are starting to drive to. We've, we've proven this again and again. And so that level of saturation and bandwidth is really crucial to creating that entire environment. Now I'm gonna go ahead and run the exact same command against the same file system set. And this is going to be a 4K random block size. So now we're going from big streaming environments to maybe a different part of your workflow, which requires uh, uh, heavy lifting, high metadata operations to cross the board. And this is from a single client. And this is really the power here, 295,000 IOPS. Which is, which is super strong, but more really importantly as well is the latency that we're able to get out of this. That's 96 microseconds, not milliseconds. You know, most companies talk about sub millisecond performance. We're consistently getting well, well lower uh, latencies than that uh, across the board. 
So that gives you an idea about that type of performance capability that we have. Now, one of the things that we pride ourselves on quite a bit is the idea of continuous operations. If you're building a cluster at scale, then how do you handle transient events, such as potential failures within the system, the types of componentry where you know, anything that moves has the ability to fail at some point. So let me show you the consistency of what we're doing. Um, we're currently generating 9.7 to 9.8 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. And we're actually gonna go into IPMI and I'm gonna go ahead and power cycle down an entire storage host that we have in the environment. Let me fast forward a little bit here. There we go. That's the guy that's gonna go down. And what the system is doing now is we said, we understand that we have a failure. Now, by default within a Weka system, we go ahead and do a striping plus two uh, failures that we tolerate within the system at any point. And, and by the way, that can be expanded if you want to up to four simultaneous failures with, within the system without any sort of uh, 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 downtime or any sort of uh, impact to the system. In fact, while the system is down, you can see that we're still generating the exact same performance. And now we've gone ahead and we're gonna go ahead and knock out a second environment right now. We're still generating 10 gigabytes per second of performance across the board due to the nature of how we do the parallelism within the system, how we distribute the metadata, uh, et cetera. So we do give you the ability to drill down in here and you can see what's protected, what is the status of how fast we begin to rebuild the data that, that has gone away onto the other hosts using our calculations that we do on the back end. And again, performance never goes down. Now, as we begin to bring a system back online uh, and, and have it rebuild, if the system comes back up, we solve the problem and bring it back, we do something a little bit unique. We do not continue to calculate for the data that has gone offline when that system went down. What we will do is because we own all the metadata, we will actually go ahead and say, and understand that we know what has been already re been recalculated and what hasn't. And for the data that has not been recalculated and is suddenly available again, we just make it immediately available within the system, zero downtime, continuous operations, and as, at high, as high performance as possible. And again, the second system comes back in. Now, you're going to see this term in the next two videos called drive phasing. And that's the idea of how we move data on and off of the actual NVMe devices uh, on the fly. Uh, that phasing essentially is, is, is our way of saying that we're moving data, we're making sure that, the, that the, we're populating the data or evacuating the data as appropriate across the system. All right. We finished the phasing in of the drives, all the data is back to normal, we've rebalanced and everything's back up to normal here. All right, let me grab the next one here. So a critical operation that we think separates us uh, significantly from these legacy parallel file systems is the ability to do expansion or resizing of systems on the fly. Um, because of the nature of traditional parallel file systems, when they, uh, when you have to build all those different layers and the complexity that's in place, it makes it very hard to do this. With Weka, all you have to have is a host that you've prepared, you've racked and stacked it, given it a basic management IP uh, and a basic Linux OS. Now you just go in and through the UI, you can quickly just set things like host configurations, uh, assign the number of cores, which drives, what networks you want to use it to talk to the rest of the cluster on. And at that point, you're literally just clicking a button and you can expand the entire cluster. Oops, there we go. On the fly. And you'll see the new system is coming up. Everything's ready. And now it's beginning the process, as I mentioned before, of phasing those drives in. And what that phasing is, in is in this particular case is a rebalancing of data because we want to take advantage of the additional performance and the scale that comes with adding both the cores and the NVMe drives 
uh, on the fly into the system. So we are immediately able to handle data management or uh, data uh, performance uh, the second it comes in. And as soon as data has begun to be uh, written to those drives, that data is available for performance. And as you notice here, we jumped all the way from nine and a half gigs a second to approximately 11 gigs a second across the board as it continues to phase this data in. So we're taking that performance advantage uh, uh, into place immediately. All right, let me just fast forward through there. And then of course, there's the opposite. You have customers who sit there and, and have said, you know, I need to go ahead and pull systems out. I wanna upgrade maybe a particular host. I wanna take advantage of new technologies. And so they wanna pull uh, hosts out, put new hosts in. And this is the other half of the equation, which is shrinking out. And again, while some legacy parallel file systems are able to grow with complexity, virtually none of them have the ability to shrink out with any grace at all. So in this particular case, we've identified that particular host uh, that we put into place in the, in, in the first uh, vid or the previous video. And at this point, literally, I just say, do you want to deactivate the drives? And once it's done, do I want to deactivate the actual host? Deactivating the drives actually creates a copy out process for the data. We're not doing a recalculation. We're actually taking any unique data that is on those particular NVMe drives and we're beginning to replicate it into the rest of the cluster so that the cluster has immediate access to it with zero calculation. So it only takes a network function. It doesn't take any additional type of compute or, or functionality there in order to make this happen uh, at very high speed. Once the system has finished phasing the drives out, oops, there we go then we can go ahead and actually just, uh, let's see here, where's the button for it? There it is. And just say, please take the host out of activation. It unregisters it from the cluster. And now it just becomes a system that can be used for whatever other purpose. You can remove it, put a new one in that's been upgraded. You can repurpose it as a, as a client somewhere, um, do whatever you want. But the key factor here is how simple this is to do. Uh, we've removed a tremendous amount of complexity that you would associate with any of those other parallel file systems in order to do this type of uh, work. And again, continuous operations at very, very high performance points. All right, so now let's, let's go and do this without a net. So I actually spun up um, a little bit earlier this morning a couple of environments, and I'm going to go back and forth with them. Um, so I have a primary environment. This actually is in AWS. This is a live system, as you can see. I can move back and forth here and get, there we go, and get information about any of the hosts, any of the cluster, um, including what the clients are. And I want to give you a brief tour of what our UI looks like. And and in, in some cases, how we uh, address the environment. So what we've done in our UI is we've categorized things in terms of what are common day-to-day -day events versus things that are a little bit less common. So every single day, people look at it and they say, I need to monitor my system, right? This is the sysadmin type of view. The first part, right, is we give you the system overview page, basic information on the hardware, the environment, the status of it, what the data protection looks like, and then some basic performance and capacity characteristics that are in place as well. We can drill down a little bit farther into this if you want to for things like performance. So we actually give you the equivalent of a top function um, across the environment. And you can go ahead and look at it from a time slice standpoint and drill in even deeper as to CPU, network, drive performance, et cetera, within the WECA environment. We even give you the ability to look at the current status of the clients that are all attached to your environment. So again, the types of quick monitoring things to determine health, status, uh, basic functionality. The next step we get into is for the customer that wants to do the type of deeper drill down into what's going on in the system at any given point in time. For example, 
right here is the full events log and this is fully EMS compatible so you can go ahead and export all of these logs out of the system into a centralized log management system if you want to. Um, and again, you can go in determine what's in place who created the event uh, what's happened and the uh, status of it. One of the more powerful things that we've done. Uh, is create a very comprehensive onboard statistics package. And what I like about this is that you can go ahead and add statistics around CPU utilization, object storage, operations, NFS, et cetera, and literally just clicking them. So let's take a look at get adders. Let's look at object storage. Uh, there we go, number of object downloads that are happening. Uh, CPU. Um, there we go, CPU utilization. And across this, as it keeps pulling through, you have the ability to do correlation because we can take a time slice and view exactly what it was across all these parameters at any given point in time. Very powerful for troubleshooting, very powerful for correlating with any sort of event in the system where you have a timestamp, you can see in real time graphically what's going on. And of course, you can filter these out as needed. We also have the ability to do, uh, uh, obviously, mount file systems. And I'm going to show you this in a live demo in a minute here about how we add and do other functions to the file system. So I'm not going to deep dive on this right now. We also, as Shimon mentioned, can connect an object store or multiple object stores on the back end. In this particular case, I've already gone ahead and pre-built a S3 bucket uh, in Amazon. I've connected it to on the back end, and you'll see how this plays into our demo uh, in just a few minutes here. And then, of course, on top of that, uh, if you have other protocols and you want to do this unified type of storage, you have the ability to add NFS and SMB, and it's just built in. Um, you don't need to fire up additional gateways and things like that, etc. And then finally, we get into user management, authentication, uh, and the ability to do um, uh, segregation of data and segregation of rights into organizational groups, which gives you essentially the first portion of what, of what is essentially a multi-tenancy type of structure where you can have a, a cluster admin and then delegate out to organizations the ability to talk to uh, various file systems within the environment. So with that, let me go ahead and actually do a couple of things here. So the first thing I want to show you is we have a default file system uh, that's in place when you fire up a new cluster. And again, this is an AWS right now. It's a relatively small environment, uh, but we have a number of terabytes that are available. So I'm going to go ahead and add a new file system. And it tells me that all the capacity within the cluster is already taken when I did this. So I'm going to go ahead and go right into the environment. And I'm going to resize this. So instead of being at 6.8 or 6.9 uh, terabytes here, tibibytes, I'm going to go ahead and take this down to, say, a four tibibyte environment. And actually, before I do that, let me just move this slightly out of the way. Before I do that, let me go onto this environment here. And let me just do a DF minus H. And we say that we had the 6.9 terabytes that was available already. So I'm going to go ahead and reconfigure this to four tibibytes. It changed already here. And one of the unique values of our POSIX client that we do is that if I go ahead and repeat that same function, we have immediately resized on the client down to four, uh, four tibibytes as well. And this is extremely powerful because it means that for customers with a workflow, where they have to make decisions about keeping systems online and that continuous operation, they no longer have to do what a lot of other parallel file systems do, which is please completely unmount and then completely remount your client in order to make this available. So uh, a really great way of keeping that continuous workflow and continuous operations going. So now that I have some free space uh, in the cluster, I'm going to go ahead and add a new file system. So we're just going to call this uh, FS2 uh, in this case as a second file system. 
And I'm going to go ahead and create this entirely on the flash tier itself. So I'm going to do something relatively small, something like 300 gigabytes and create. Congratulations. It's that fast in order to create a brand new file system on there. So piece of cake and simple. But John, I don't I, really I, want I would to. like to emphasize also what you didn't need to do, right? Um, you didn't need to yes. choose a block size. You didn't need to choose a RAID stripe, a RAID controller. You just created the file system. Absolutely. All of the backend hardware and all of the functions that you do in a layered complex system of understanding the drives and the RAID and then potentially having things like HBAs that talk to the front end controllers and then making sure the capacity is set and setting different parameters. We've, we've, you know, in a nutshell, we've removed the nerd knobs as much as you want to. We want to make this as absolutely simple as possible uh, compared to any of those other uh, parallel file systems that are out there. Thank you, Shimon. Appreciate it. So I'm going to go ahead and actually create a third file system here. Oops. There we go. And I'm going to call it FS3. And I'm going to do something a little bit different. Shimon and Laurent talked about the ability to add object to the back end here. So I'm going to go ahead and create a, a file system that is hybrid in nature. So again, something like 200 gigabytes in size, but the total capacity, because I'm going to use S3 as a backing store behind it, I'm going to add an additional five, well, I don't know, five petabytes in place here. And literally, that's it. We now have the ability to present a five petabyte data store. So let me go in here and I'm going to do a quick, uh, let's go, uh, let's see here. Make, uh, whoops. Pseudo make there slash mount. And I call that FS3, right? I believe. Yeah, this is FS3. So now I'm going to go ahead and do a like a John, if you want to increase the font a bit, by the way. Oh, it's still still a little small. Uh, maybe okay. for my okay. eyes, but uh, yeah. Okay. You're getting old, Shimon. There we go. Is that better for everyone to see? I think it is. I'll take thing. silence as an I'll take silence as an answer here. Yes, it takes a while sometimes to come off mute. Sorry, but it's definitely a yes. Fantastic. Fantastic. Oops. Uh, and we'll go to Weka 3. Okay. Sometimes sure, when you're doing this. The file system name. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. There we go, and that was FS3. Sometimes when you're moving really fast, you miss the little things. There we go. And if I go ahead and do a DF minus H again, we see that we immediately have five petabytes of storage that are available on that mount as a parent. And again, very similar to what we can do, we've done before. If I go ahead, even though it's backed by S3, if I go ahead and edit this and move it to something like six petabytes, because we suddenly have that, that need, some huge ingest comes in, six petabytes in place. Congratulations, six petabytes is shown right here. Now, I'm actually going to go into the system, and I'm going to begin to do a process to showcase a little bit of the data protection capability that we have. So if I go in, uh, let's go to uh, mount three. It's empty right now. I'm going to go ahead and actually add a or build a file in there really quick. So it's a small file. There we go. But we've created a small one megabyte file just called file one that's in this, in this type of environment. 
or, or inside of that file system. So now the next step that I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna take a snapshot of that data. In this case, we're gonna call it snap one, give it an access uh, point for it, uh, where, it would, where it would connect back into the system if, uh, with a name. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and create. So we now have an instantaneous file system that's been put into place. Uh, the ability now to take that data as a, as a point in time image and restore it wherever we want to. So I'm gonna take that particular snapshot and with one simple command here, I'm gonna upload this into that S3 bucket and it's going in place. So it's gonna take a few seconds to upload here, but now that it's fully synchronized, it has moved that, that snapshot. Now the snapshot is essentially a self-contained type of item, it contains both the data and the metadata for the file system. And that gives it the capability of being able to be restored to any Weka system uh, anywhere. So one thing I wanna do is, is note this, that snapshot has been given an identifier within the object store. And this will become crucial to restoring it. There we go, come on. So I'm gonna copy that ID out because we're gonna need it in, in a minute here. So what I'm actually going to do is it'd be cool to restore this directly to this system right here, but I'm gonna go one step further. Here's a second system that I have built inside of Amazon. We'll just quickly, ooh, quickly log in. Okay. Okay, now I'm confused. Uh, give me one, again, this is the danger of uh, working without a net. So tell you what, I think I, I was going to show you how to uh, connect this to a, uh, a second cluster and be aware that we can absolutely do this, but I am just going to connect it back to the original cluster that we had in place instead. So I apologize for uh, that. That was working perfectly this morning. Well, I think, I, I, that I think I, that's a great demon demonstration of the security feature. It, exactly, right? <laughs> so let me go ahead and add a new file system back in place. Uh, actually, before I do that, that particular file that I that I put in place on onto the original system here, I'm going to go ahead and do an MD5 hash on it real quick, just to show you uh, what we have. And that's the exact same data that's in place. So there's your there's your hash indicator of the MD5 uh, setup. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new file system here. Now again, I'll call this uh, something like FS4. And I'll give it a capacity. And this is very unique. We only look at the used capacity within the snapshot. So you do not have to have the exact same capacity on the destination where you're recovering. You just need to have enough space for the active data that was snapshotted to be brought back into place. So in this case, I'm gonna use uh, 100 gigabytes, uh, but I'm gonna turn tiering on just in case I had a lot of data. I'm only gonna make this one petabyte in size. Now I'm gonna use, I'm gonna create the file system from an uploaded snapshot. And so if I copy that lo locator back into place, I create it, it has now finished syncing up and it is ready. And at this point, I can go ahead and create and mount that particular file system. And we'll just call this Weka 4 as the file system. And actually, let me, uh, let me get out of there really quick. Um, okay, and then again, we'll go back and we will mount. Oops. There we go. We'll change this to FS4. And 
like a four. Okay, we've now mounted it. We have file one. And if we come back up here, we see that the original file right here and the new file once created in the new file system, exact same identifiers. And the power of this really is that with a customer, if they wanna take this data and they wanna take this, this S3 object store and create file systems, they wanna burst out to a new location to do additional analytics. They wanna to go to a second location to do reporting types of structures. This is very powerful because they don't have to change their workflow. This could be on-prem, this could be in the cloud, and it appears to be identical data in the exact same structures across the board. And the, I think one of the things that, that gets a little bit lost here is that doing this one at a time for recovery or one at a time for bursting, it's great. But at the customers that we're beginning to deal with, we're now talking with customers that, that have said, we need to have thousands of snapshots. We have thousands of file systems that we want to act on. Uh, we have one particular financial services customer that actually is in the hundreds and approaching thousands of file systems where they, they provision them out to developers and to do financial analytics and things like that. They go ahead and recycle and update their environments using this technology on, a, on actually, I think it's a weekly basis now. And so the ability to go ahead and say, I have a common source of truth that I can update, create the new environment, generate the workflows is, is absolutely powerful. Um, and I'm just gonna finish up. I know that I'm, I'm slightly off time here, but the one thing I'm gonna finish up with is in terms of the additional manageability, there, there's two quick things I wanna show you. The first one is we've actually built and our customers are doing this an entire Jenkins driven environment where we can build lab environments on the fly. And a lot of this is done using things like just Python, Ansible, um, common uh, uh, RESTful APIs. And in fact, one of the things that we're doing right now is, let me go ahead and punch this in. We actually now have a full set of APIs in a Swagger environment that you can go ahead and use to manage your environment any way you want. Uh, a very rich and diverse set of APIs that match up not just to the CLI and the GUI, but also have unique compound features within them that can help automate uh, really and get to that kind of lights out data center or highly automated workflow uh, for your infrastructure, for your platforms, et cetera. And with that, I'm gonna take a look at the chat and see if there's anything else that needs to be addressed or if Shimon has grabbed all of them. But I think that is pretty much the end of my demo. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you want to know or see any other types of things, please let us know. We're happy to uh, we're happy to show you more with what we have. Okay, excellent. So um, we can now um, open the floor to questions. Does anyone have, I know not everyone had spoken to um, Weka um, from, the, from the audience we have here today. Um, but whether you had or you had not, does anyone have any questions? Did you hear anything that actually surprised you today that you thought was not what you were expecting? Lisa, guess, would you like I to- I guess I do, have, I do have a question, Fred. Um, this uh, is similar to the last presentation. It's all dependent on having M NVMe drives on your, on your computers, I guess. It's actually not on your computers. It's all NVMe's on the storage environment. Oh, okay. But what? Mm -hmm. So actually, this eliminates the need for your to manage and and purchase local NVMe's on your compute servers because what we're saying here is that Weka is a shared environment that will overperform your local NVMe's. So imagine GPU servers. No, no, I understand. And I'm just wondering yeah. whether you know there's an awful lot of non-NVMe drives still installed in, in lots of enterprises. So this is a, a future um, benefit for companies that have you know massive masses of resources in the existing storage. 
there is an awful lot of HDDs and Weka is actually able to utilize these environments by expanding the namespace over to an object okay. store, to object stores that are actually okay, HDD got it. based. Well, thank you. Okay, does anyone else yeah. have any comments or questions for the Weka team? So we are, uh, I was informed that we actually got a side message from Chris Meller that I'm not seeing him. Will he get a recording or uh, don't know? Uh, but basically, uh, sorry, Lisa. I was just going to say, Chris has joined, um, but yes, he will get a copy. Everyone will get a copy of the presentation once you approve it. And they right. will also get a copy of the slides tonight. All right, terrific. So uh, so Chris asked, hey, how is Wacker doing in the uh, post uh, Ken Grohe days? And um, basically, our, there is no material change in our day-to-day -day operation. Ken uh, remains an advisor to us, and it helps us amplify our message. Um, we are uh, executing very well. So we just finished our Q2. Uh, we showed about 50% growth over Q1 in uh, uh, TCV, our biggest quarter ever in ARR, our biggest quarter ever in amount of new logos, biggest quarter ever in amount of expansion, uh, amount of uh, customers on, uh, on the AWS. So it's terrific. We've announced we, we have hired directors to manage both EMEA and APEC. And we're entering Q3 with a very strong pipeline uh, worldwide. And we actually, for Q3, I think it's gonna be the first quarter where we're gonna see very good coverage from our three main geos. So usually we, we, we ended up landing most of the number from the US, a little bit from Europe. Uh, you no know, anecdotes from, from EMEA, uh, sorry, from uh, uh, APAC. And this Q3, we're, we're expecting very impressive numbers throughout. So, uh, uh, so from that, we are very optimistic. Fantastic, that's great. Anyone have any anything else they'd like to say, to ask while you have the chance? Uh, yeah, Liren, um, nice, nice to talk to you again. Uh, I think two years since we last spoke. Uh, yeah, a while. The, the story hasn't changed. Sorry, that Brian, much. you've got big feedback. Oh, sorry. I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure how to fix that. Sorry. Uh, just quickly okay. then. Um, can, can you just highlight the, the major changes over the last two years? Because obviously the technology is broadly similar. Um, so what would you highlight the, the, the updates have been over two years? So our vision remains the same. We are building the storage for the big digital transformation that organizations are going through, moving to the cloud and adopting GPUs. I think the big difference is uh, how prevalent cloud and GPUs become. Another big difference is our approachability. So two years ago, when we discussed NVMe storage was very expensive. Nowadays, with economies of scale, we're actually able to compete and sell at lower price point than many other all flash solutions. So two years ago, we were um, only approachable, only available to the very high end use cases and the customer that had to use uh, the, the highest end, uh, you know, they they couldn't get a job without a Ferrari, so they had to shell out the quits to buy a Ferrari. Uh, nowadays, you can buy the Ferrari and pay the price price point. So this is one one big change that it really happened with NVMe prices plummeting. The other thing that has happened is our go to market and ecosystem. So we've shown that we have ability to qualify and we're qualified with all the large vendors. We are an AWS primary storage competency partner. And uh, the biggest change two years ago, you either bought 
uh, the system from Weka, or we were meeting uh, in the channel where some VAR was buying the hardware, putting our solution. Now you're actually buying Weka appliances from the vendors you like working for. So you buy a Weka appliance from Hewlett Packard Enterprise and with, with their support, you buy the Weka appliance from Itachi with their HCSF, you, got, you buy the Weka appliance from Supermicro. It's a huge, huge difference. So while our vision didn't change, we've made dramatic improvements and uh, really innovated in the ability to take software-based storage to market. And you know, you've, you've heard, you've all heard about you know, SDS in the last decade. And we're not saying SDS because that, that term has failed miserably. The reason it failed miserably is because no vendor executed in a go-to-market that breeds software storage to the customers. And they just expected customers to integrate it themselves. What we've done, we've come up with a superior enough product that the large server vendors want to take to their customers and will make it easy to consume. So we are bringing the software storage revolution, not as the features, that customers are going to compromise on other things and leverage, but just as another advantage uh, to how they consume. And I think this is, if I, if I had to pinpoint the biggest difference over the last couple of years, it's this one. Does it make sense? Yeah, so it's, con it's consumability really and um, evolving the channel. Thank you, yeah. <laughs>